Okay, so welcome to my talk. I'll be talking about our journey to implement visual search on Allegro. Uh, all, the, all the work done here was uh, done together with uh, Jaroslav Boyar and Piotr Rybak. Unfortunately, they couldn't join us today. Uh, so, let's begin with the basics. What actually is visual search? Uh, let's imagine that we have such situation that a, friend's, a friend asked us, hey, could you buy me this dress on Allegro? I don't have an account there, but she sent us only a picture. I would say, okay, sign up for yourself. It's easy, it takes a minute. But in the end, I'm trying to find it for an hour. We could try simply to type down uh, red dress and see what results we get. But unfortunately, uh, those are just decent. Not all the dresses are exactly what we've been looking for. Uh, we can narrow down the search by using uh, some attribute filtering. We can type in that the color is red, we have long sleeves, uh, there is no visible pattern, and we can get pretty decent results with the dress in the first row, the third one, looking pretty similar. But what about this one? Uh, which color should we pick? So is it blue or white? We know that the sleeves are long, but I have no idea what pattern is this. To me, it looks like a Chinese porcelain, but there is no such filter to pick, so it would be hard. But since we have a picture, we can obviously use it. Uh, we can represent a picture as a tensor of three RGB uh, channels. Uh, this is a simplified diagram for one channel. And we could use this to find uh, the most similar images uh, in our database. So for this dress, we get five most similar images that look like this. And I would say that they, ha they all have just one thing in common, that is they are all lying on really ugly floor, and there is nothing, nothing more. So since just the pixels are not enough, we can use neural networks and see if that helps. We'll be using a model called ResNet, which was originally designed for a classification task. Uh, but we are not going to use it for classification. Uh, we'll be simply taking the representation from the penultimate layer just before classifier and using that to obtain closest images. Obviously, the right approach for this would be transfer learning, as training uh, such network as ResNet from scratch would be quite time consuming. So we'll use the version trained on ImageNet. As we all know, the ImageNet dataset, uh, we have there 8,000 classes, starting from dogs and cats, ending with airplanes and trucks. So model trained to classify those may not be the perfect scenario to find a similar dress, but let's use those representations and see what happens. The results are, well, we no longer get the ugly floor, but the results are not really much better. Uh, but honestly, it's hard to say if anything has changed. So let's settle for some metric, how we can measure the effectiveness of such, ser such search. Uh, here we'll be using accuracy at five as a percentage of successful queries, where by successful query, I mean one when, where within five, five most similar images, we find the item that we've been looking for, and the failed one when we don't. What are the results when it comes to numbers? Um, well, the pixels didn't work well. ImageNet was 200 times better, and we get 2% accuracy, which is not great. So maybe let's try something different. We could try to predict the attributes. Instead of predicting, uh, instead of predicting dogs and cats and so on, we could train our network to predict what attributes uh, a, net, uh, a dress has. We have quite a lot of data. We have 700,000 offers just in the dresses category, and each offer is described with several attributes. Uh, let's see if our model can learn those, and how does that affect our training. But first, we have to know if our model actually can learn th those attributes. Here again, we have to pick some metric. Uh, for us, it will be area under the rock curve. And as you can see from the graphs of the training progress, uh, we quite quickly got to 97%. So this is a really good result. I would say that's a suspiciously good result. And why is that? Turns out that there are many duplicates in our data set. And what's worse, those duplicates are not exactly the same. There's a slight translation between one and the other image. For example, a shift by one pixel, uh, which ends up that we cannot deduplicate the, those images easily, and we end up with a data leakage between the training and testing data sets. So how can we get rid of those? Obviously, by using some 
more sophisticated the application. Uh, our pipeline took several steps. Uh, first, we would auto-crop all photos to get rid of random translations. Then we'll compute a perceptual hash on discrete cosine transform. Uh, and we'll add some information about hue as p hashes are color invariant. And using those hashes, we'll be able to uh, detect uh, duplicates in our data set. Here you can see a histogram of our uh, duplicates in our original data set. And as you can see, on some instances, we had over 600 images that were pretty much the same. So if we get rid of those, our data set suddenly becomes, uh, become much smaller, uh, around 20% of what we had uh, in the beginning. The results still are quite, uh, really good. We get accuracy of 33%. Uh, so I will be quite happy with that. But how does it translate to actual images and actual image search? I would say that the results are not as good as I would have hoped. Uh, we can see that we can get dress of overall the same cut, the same neckline, length of sleeves. We can even find the Chinese porcelain dress, the second one. But still, it's not really, uh, not really there. It's not uh, visually similar. Also, we have lots of categories with no attributes, so we wouldn't be able to scale this approach up to, for example, uh, notebooks or, uh, or phones. Also, we are not controlling what we are learning. We are basically telling our network, OK, could you predict those attributes? And then we are using the representation to find similar images. This is not always possible. So maybe we can try and find, uh, to find some other approach that is more direct. Uh, the answer may be a uh, Siamese network, uh, which basically is constructed as follows. Instead of using single image and classifying something, we provide two images uh, for the training. Then we pass them through our encoder. We get an embedding for both images. And then we're trying to predict if those are the same, uh, the same dress, it will be our positive, or two different dresses, it will be negative. Uh, we will be losing, uh, using contrastive loss for this, but this is not, uh, not important now, so we'll not get into the details. But there is a harder question. How can we get such pairs? For the negatives, it would be quite easy, as we just can pick two random images from our uh, platform, and we get a negative pair. But when it comes to positives, it's much harder. We could turn to external data sets, for example, Stanford Online Products. Uh, we have over 120,000 uh, image pairs crawled from eBay. Unfortunately, there are no fashion images and we were supposed to start with that category. Also, there are some better data sets, for example, Deep Fashion, where we have exactly what we were looking for. Uh, we have nearly one million uh, image pairs of clothing. Then we've got some other smaller data sets, like Darn or Fashion AI. Unfortunately, they all have just one thing in common. Uh, they are for non-commercial purposes, so we cannot use them. OK, so if we cannot turn to something external, maybe we have the data already on Allegro. For example, we have such cool features as product reviews. Uh, our users like them. They write them quite often. And what's better, they post photos of the products they bought. So this would be the perfect scenario, because we get one nice uh, shop-looking shop uh, photo, and then another one taken in more natural environment by the user, probably on themselves or lying somewhere. This should be perfect, but unfortunately, while on the entire Allegro we have 41,000 uh, such pairs, for dresses we have just 27. And as you all know, 27 is not enough to train a neural network. So what do we have a lot on Allegro? We have lots of offers. So we've got uh, offers with multiple images. So we could simply pick two images randomly from an offer and provide them as a positive pair. Then we can train the model on those. This way, we have one and a half million uh, pairs just for dresses. So the numbers are there. Uh, but did it work? No. We get 6% uh, accuracy. And this is not a really good result. So what can we do now? In machine learning, we can either go for better data or better model. 
I firmly believe that better data is crucial, so we'll start with that. And let's take a look at the photos that we actually have in our data set. Uh, we have some, one would call them useless pairs, uh, where, for example, we have a dress and a size table. This may be very useful for the customer, but for our model, it's pretty much impossible to learn from this. Uh, so that's not useful for us. Also, we have a bigger problem. We have a trivial naive image pairs, uh, where we have pretty much the same image uh, on multiple photos ad added by the seller. Uh, therefore, our model learns a very, sh very shallow relationship between those images and eventually degenerates to similarity between pixels, and that didn't work at all. We could classify images that we have in our data set and simply divide them into a few categories. Uh, for example, we have uh, product images uh, either on its own or on a model uh, in a shop fashion, uh, or we have those same, the same items on the street in a more natural environment. Uh, so we can create those uh, categories of useful images. And then we have also some less useful images. We have collages of multiple photos, which are widely popular in fashion category. Uh, but unfortunately, those are not really useful for us, as we cannot pick just one color and then compare it with something that's single on an image. Then we've got close-ups on details, like this button. And while this may be, again, uh, this may again look nice, it's hard to see our model learning how the dress looks based on a single button. Then we've got all the size tables, directions to shops, uh, some logos, and the, uh, et cetera, that end up in the trash category, and everything else that we were unable to classify, classify in the other category. So we could split our data set into those categories and basically clean it before the proper training. But to do so, we need a classifier. And we need a, to, to train a classifier, we need uh, some images that are already class classified. And it's hard to see anything else other than simply annotating them by hand, which is really time consuming and very tedious. So fortunately, we can be a bit clever here. Uh, we can use something referred often to as active learning. So basically, we'll take a few hundred of photos, we'll annotate those, this will take, I don't know, an hour or so, then we'll train our model based on that, we'll take all the remaining pictures, uh, we'll get predictions for those, and then we'll take those pictures where our model is certain, uh, which category to assign, and put them to the labeled ones, then take some of the uh, unlabeled, uh, then the, uh, some of the uh, images where our model had no idea which category to assign, uh, re-annotate them, and retrain our model. Do this a few times, and within a dozen or so hours, we got a uh, data set of 20,000 images and accuracy of 98%. So this is quite good. Let's use that to clean our data set and see if that helped. We'll take all our uh, images, image pairs. We'll start with the pictures in the offer. Uh, then we'll use the classifier to predict their type. Uh, we'll get one of those eight categories. Then we'll discard those giant categories. And from the useful types, we'll create pairs. But we would like to create them uh, so they differ on the product, uh, product model and street shop dimensions. Uh, this way, our model hopefully will learn about the product itself and not around about the background, uh, about the setting uh, in which uh, is it's displayed. Unfortunately, this does uh, reduce our data set quite significantly. We started with one and a half million random pairs. Now we have only 12,000 filtered pairs, so that's significantly small, smaller, but it works. We get 21% accuracy, which is way better than what we had with random pairs. Okay, but that's still worse than 33%. So we have the better data now. Let's go to the better model. We can use something called triplet loss, uh, where instead of providing pairs for training, we'll provide triplets. We have an anchor, a positive, and a negative. Anchor is often referred to as query. Then we have a positive that's similar to our query, and we have to provide some negative with item that's different, with an image that's different from what we are looking for. So the idea is that 
we would like to move the embedding of the positive and the anchor as close as possible to themselves. And then we want to push the negative uh, further. So then when we are looking for an image, the embedding of the positive image is closer. This sort of makes sense. Uh, so let's formalize it. We would have a loss function that takes uh, a triplet of anchor positive and negative. We would like to minimize the distance between the anchor and the positive. Then we would like to maximize the distance between anchor and negative, but just by some margin. We don't want to push it as far as possible. We don't really need that. Uh, so if it's further than some margin, then that's OK. So let's add that term. Uh, if, our, uh, if, if we actually have a positive that's closer to an anchor than our negative, then we don't want to learn anything new. So our loss function will be 0. And it works, finally. We get 50% accuracy, so it's better than the attributes. Uh, but maybe we can do something else. Uh, triplet loss is still an ongoing area of research, so there are multiple ways to improve it. Uh, we could use, uh, we could start with the selection of our negatives. We assume that if the negative is far enough, then we don't want to push it further away. So this is generally right, uh, it makes sense. But the problem is that uh, our current negatives, as the model is training, uh, as the model is training, are already far enough. So we get really easy negatives, and our model is learning nothing new, as this triplet satisfies our scenario. So we, what we want are hard negatives, where we find something that's closer uh, to the query uh, than the positive plus margin. Uh, such approach can be often called uh, hard negatives mining, or if you are looking for the hard negative within your training batch, it will be the batch hard strategy. Here we have a graph showing uh, percentage of active triplets over the course of the training. So what I mean by an active triplet is a one that we can learn something from. So basically our loss, uh, loss value for that uh, triplet is not zero. So as you can see, for random negatives, we quickly get a drop to 10%. So that means that only 10% of our data actually allow us to learn something new. For hard negatives, we start at 100% and then we end up at around 50, uh, which is a much better result. So that, how does it translate to our results? We get much better results, 71% accuracy. Uh, just by applying hard negatives instead of random negatives. Uh, so this is quite, quite good. But this is just a number. Let's see if it really worked. Uh, in the upper row, we have uh, the model based on attributes, as shown previously. Uh, in the lower row, we have hard negatives. Uh, as you can see, we deal with the color much better. But we have some problems with coherence when it comes to attributes. Uh, our dresses in the lower row do not all have the same length of sleeve, the same neckline, uh, although they do look uh, pretty similar, at least to me. So, <laughs> what can we do? Uh, okay, just one more example. Uh, it really worked for the dress with Chinese porcelain pattern because we were able to find three exact matches. Uh, but when it comes to the third and the fifth dress, uh, still, again, we have the same problem. We have different length of sleeve, or no sleeves at this, in this case. So the obvious idea would be to take this model, which is way better when it comes to color, and combine this with attribute prediction. Uh, as I said previously, we cannot always use attribute prediction, but when, when it comes to fashion, it's pretty straightforward. We can settle for it, and we can use it. So we would... Uh, create a model that would combine those two. We'll take our triplet, we'll pass all the images through our encoder. It's still the same ResNet as previously. Then we'll get embeddings for each image. We'll compute our triplet loss on those images. And then we'll add a classification head. Uh, uh, some classification for multiple uh, attributes. Now comes the question, which one is more important? What's more important, getting the dress of the same color or looking for dresses with the same neckline, length of sleeve, and so on? Uh, I'm not guessing, I have no idea. 
uh, we'll refer to a technique introduced by Alex Kendall for uh, multitask learning, which basically adds a sigma parameter for each loss term. And then the model learns uh, those parameters along with the weights uh, during the over the course of the training. Therefore, we don't have to uh, weigh them by ourselves, but the model will adjust those weights uh, as the training progresses. Did it work? No. We get slightly worse model. And that's really surprising because for me it made sense. Uh, so let's take a look again what might have happened. So basically we had this, uh, this architecture. And what I didn't tell you uh, was that we had also a L2 normalization layer of our embeddings. This works brilliantly for triplet loss because we put those embeddings in the same space. It's easier to find them. But for attribute prediction, it does not necessarily loss. Uh, works, uh, especially with softmax. So what we did was to reroute the input for our attribute prediction uh, and provide them with anormalized embeddings. Now it works. We've got 74% accuracy. It's better than just harder negatives. Maybe the result is not really uh, shocking. It's just 3%, just but it's still better. So what else can we do? How else can we improve this model? Uh, as I said previously, we are still using the same ResNet uh, model as Backbone, and it's still pre-trained on ImageNet. So let's take a look at to, into pre-training, and maybe we can do something about this. Uh, we have a very good quality data set for fine-tuning, where we have high-quality triplets, uh, we have uh, hard batch sampling, but we don't have a huge data set to pre-train our model. So recent paper from Facebook uh, proved that pre-training on huge data set, even if it's not perfect, uh, works. They used Instagram, uh, and they, they were predicting hashtags. Uh, so we can borrow the same idea and try it on uh, our data set. Basically, the problem here is that, obviously, they did uh, make their model public, but for non-commercial purposes, so we cannot use it. But on Allegro, we have lots of offers. So we can go back to our random pair selection. So we'll take the first image from, uh, from an offer. It will be our query or an anchor. Then we'll take another image as a positive, maybe the second image just without no, no sampling. Then we'll apply our hard batch, uh, batch hard strategy and find the hardest batch uh, in our training data set. This way, we get a data set with over 100 million offers, therefore 100 million images. And we called it random hard triplets, which made sense at the time. Uh, as if you recall cor correctly, uh, on ImageNet pre-trained, we had just 2%. Then we we're using random pairs from, the, from dresses, we got 6%. Now, pre-training for a few days on whole Allegro on huge data set, gave us 37%. So this is quite a rise. It gets close to the attribute prediction model. But this is just for whole Allegro. This is just a base for us to start from. So let's combine it with uh, our model, uh, where we combine attributes, attribute prediction, and triplet loss. And in the end, we have pre-trained two-in-one model, which gets 81%. For me, that's a great result. But let's take a look. Uh, well, all dresses have the same pretty much cut. They have the same length of a sleeve. They are all, all almost red. And to me, they look really good. But what would happen if you actually didn't have a picture? You have just some vague representation of what you would like to buy in your head. Uh, if you can draw, maybe you can draw this, and maybe it works. We did try that on this New Balance shoe, and turns out there is one that's quite similar. But OK, no one has to know how to draw. It may be worse. So maybe some doodling will be enough. This is not something that we're trying to achieve, but uh, thankfully it uh, turned, turned out that our model generalizes quite well, and simply drawing something is enough uh, to find it on Allegro. Thank you for your attention. Uh, 
if you have any questions, I will be happy to take them. I would like just to say that we are also hiring. We are looking for research engineers and data scientists. Uh, so if you think that you can beat our 81%, please join us. We'll be more than happy to uh, welcome you. Question. Uh, great talk and great case, by the way. <laughs> uh, what was the, uh, because I, I think either I missed it or misunderstood, what was the um, at the output of your model and was it embedding? And if it was embedding, how you managed to uh, search effectively with the vector? Uh, we are using a, um, it's called FICE. It's an engine from Facebook to find basically the most similar vectors, uh, uh, the neighboring vectors. So it's... But you're just, how, how many uh, samples you had for search, let's say? Because you have to compare them, so th I don't know what's the um, base for search that you um, use. But you mean on the on our evaluation or well, on for production? For production. For production, uh, we have all the offers. So we have, we will have, when it's all production ready for all the whole Allegro, it will be 100 million offers to search in. Okay, cool. So it works. Another question? Yeah, hi, thank you for your talk, uh, and I have one question. Uh, is it, will you uh, make this model available for a uh, community to play, uh, at least to f as a search uh, within Allegro, as a product? Uh, as a product, it will be available. We will be running first external tests uh, in the first months of uh, upcoming year. Uh, but when it comes to simply giving out the model, I'm not sure yet, okay. but maybe. Thank you. One more. Hi, thank you for your speech. Uh, have you tried, uh, have you tested uh, semi-hard uh, triplets instead of uh, hard ones? Uh, yeah, we did try that. It didn't g give us any gain. Uh, we also tried a few different approaches to find uh, negatives. We did try to find them in our whole data set. Uh, but it also didn't work r really well. We are still working on it, so probably uh, during our some next presentation we'll tell more about it. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. Great applause for the talk. Thank you.